morning. The Bible reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through to 16. It's labelled unity of the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every step to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming mature, attaining to, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves that have blown here and there by every wind and teaching and by every cunning and craftiness of man in their, defeat, in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Thanks so much for reading, Bronwyn. It's a great passage of the Bible. That's the passage that our church family is studying while they're down at uh, Wollongong Surf Leisure Resort, which was a wonderful location. We've discovered it's a great, they've got such good spaces there for people to, for us to meet and do stuff. It's a great, they're having a great time. Um, and we're going through this whole passage together as a church. So we're going to have a quick look at it. And one of the, the things that's really obvious about what's going on in it is, is the first, when he says live a life worthy, you probably saw that word worthy, is this idea of um, living up. Worthy of the calling, worthy of the gospel, worthy of Jesus. Live a life in line with it. That's sort of what he's saying. And so, he, so all the way through, he uses the word walk to say that. Walk in love. Walk in wisdom. Walk in the light. Not like people who don't love and follow Jesus. In his time and era, they said, not like the Gentiles. Um, and so it's a big thing. What's it mean to live that way? He says for himself, the first phrase, I'm a prisoner for God. I'll do whatever it takes. That's what he's trying to say there. And he's been talking about the bigness of what God's done. The hugeness of the gospel. It has ramifications from before the beginning of time to the end of history. We've gone from literally death to life, right? Darkness to light. So there's been, it's a huge thing. And the image that you probably heard um, at the end of the passage there, is Christ is the head and we're the body. I, I, I want to introduce you to Daisy, one of Sarah's cute toys. Sorry, she won't mind me grabbing her leg. Uh, one of Sarah's favourite little toys. As a 22-year-old, as, as well as a <laughs> young kid, Daisy the cow, um, Daisy's head is connected to her body by thread and needle, of course. But like, this is saying Christ is our head, we're the body, Literally saying the DNA of God is coursing through your veins as a community. That's a huge idea. The life of God. See, if you lose a leg, you can still be alive. But if you lose your head, you're done. So the image is about being alive, having new life, being 
awake now, right? And this is so huge. And it's why in the next chapter, Paul shows us what type of parent he is. Because he says, wake up. <laughs> if I could say that loud, I'd say it loud. He says, wake up, O sleeper, that Christ may shine on you in chapter 5. Look, this is, uh, there's two types of parents in the room, okay? There's one type that comes in, tiptoe in, pull the blinds. Hey, sweetie, time to get up. Rubber on the back, you know. It's at morning, the alarm's gone. Have you had a good night's sleep? Come on, sweetie, time to get up. That's one type of parent. Can you put your hand up if you're the other type of parent? Smash the light on, rip the covers off. Water pistol was my little thing. Come on, they're getting out. Well, we're late, you know, whatever. Um, that's the type of parent Paul is. He's saying you need to wake up to the reality that you've got God in you, right? The image of Daisy. What do you think of when you think about the church? What do you imagine when you think, what's it mean? And, and in history, we know the church has the tendency, including us, to fall asleep. To basically, get, we get some anesthetic in us and we, we lose contact with the reality of who we really are, what we've been given. And he wants them to pay attention to their time, their cultural moment. They're at the centre of culture and trade in Ephesus and the centre of perverse cultic worship practices. There's a lot at stake to how they choose to live. You need to wake up, he's saying. It's true for us too. There's a lot at stake. If we don't take this seriously, there's so much at stake. And so that's why I'm going to help us wake up. And that's why we have a little rope. So can I get a bunch of volunteers up on stage? A bunch of you. We probably need at least 10. Young, old. Yeah, Joel. Come and grab the rope. If you're going to come and help, you've got to grab the rope. Yep. We need a bunch of you. We've got enough room here. Grab the rope. We need enough to sort of fill the rope. So we need a few more volunteers. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Actually, I might move out of the way. Okay. The challenge is, I don't need that. The challenge is, um, you can't let go of the rope and you can't speak to each other. That's going to be the hard bit. And I'm going to say a shape. You've got to turn it into a shape. The rope, okay? Somehow you've got to work together to do this. So um, can you make a triangle? You can't speak and you can't let go. And just yell out when you've got the triangle done. What sort of a triangle we got going in? <laughs> I love watching this. <laughs> well done, there's part of done well, done well. That's pretty good. Is that an isosceles? I don't know. It's not an equilateral one, I'll tell you that. Um, how about, can you give us a square? That's, maybe that's a bit easier. How about a square? <laughs> oh, wow. Is that, is that square? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, it's a square, it's good. One more. How about a, this actually should be an easy one, a pentagon. Oh. Five sides. Five-sided shape. You should be able to manage a five-sided shape. Well, we're close. What's an interesting pentagon? <laughs> Can't speak. What do you think? <laughs> There's a lot of hand signals going on. <laughs> Adapting. I like it. All right, we're going to give it to them. There's five sides. Is it? Okay, don't count, Bromwell okay. said. Give him a clap. That's pretty good effort. <laughs> you guys are legends. <laughs> It'll help us make sense of what we're talking about here. But um, just two things, maybe, with these guys um, that are crucial in the, at least the first part of the passage is 
What's going on inside each person on the rope and the rope itself? What's going on inside them and the rope itself? The two big things. Now, I'm going to make a claim here. You're like Daisy D, Scotty. No, no, it's not like a puppet. <laughs> He's a kid at heart, isn't he? This moves me. I'm going to make a claim. Even though you've got the life of God inside of you, we will live in spiritual immaturity until we do the heavy lifting of trying to maintain the unity of the Spirit. That, I think, is the argument of the passage. Even though we've got the life of God in us, among us, inside us, like Daisy, even though you've got God in you, we will remain immature until we do the heavy lifting of maintaining the unity that God's given us through his spirit. It's a very significant thing he's saying here. We live in a fragmented culture, society and churches. What are the things that we're missing that are robbing people of so much of their joy? The guy who wrote this letter was responsible for bringing together groups of people who would ordinarily hate each other. But because of the gospel, have discovered new ways of relating. So Jews and Gentiles, slave free in the Roman world. They took slaves, they took non-persons to Rome and turned them into persons. The end of the book of Romans, he names like bunches of slaves that was unheard of in the Roman world. Non-persons become people. Jesus changes the way we relate. So he's responsible for that sort of community. What do you think about when you think about the church? Paul said here in, in the first few verses, make every effort to keep this. Make every effort to keep the unity you've been given. So um, the, the idea of the words there are eager and it's urgent. I want to do something. I've got to do it now. He's saying this is way more, so to the Corinthians, they've got gross immorality, they're suing each other in court, they're getting drunk all the time. So he says, you guys need to become one. He says, love needs to define the entire enterprise now. So he's saying it's, it's urgent. So at the beginning of this book in chapter two, he says, you know, the idea of the cross, he says, Jesus died to make this happen, to make us one. And it was a part of God's plan from before the beginning of time that he would unite all things, not just us, all things under Christ. So Paul in this letter is saying it's such a big deal, it's not funny. And it's why there's, it's no coincidence that if any of you have ever experienced isolation from friendships in the church, separation from God's people, how heartbreaking and how damaging that actually is. There's, there's so many sad realities for people who've been mistreated, spiritual abuse, physical abuse, even sexual abuse, in, sadly, churches. To never return. Rightly, they would have to leave that church, but few people sometimes actually find life again in a healing, welcoming community that has a capacity to love like this. But you see, even if for whatever reason you've you know, when we suffer and go through hard things, we, we curve in on ourselves. Suffering makes us do that. And if you've experienced isolation, you know how difficult that is. So it's no coincidence that the Satan, the Satan in the Bible character, um, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, he says, I will ascend to the throne. <laughs> He's not coming together to worship God. He's doing his own deal. He could not have done the rope game. Lucifer could not have done that. Impossible, because he's doing his own thing. And so this is interesting. It's why Paul is so good. So Paul, out of the gate, he doesn't give us a strategy for organizing to make this work. He starts with a couple of character virtues. You probably heard it. Uh, he says, be completely humble and gentle and patient. He says, in some versions, says, with all humility, all gentleness. 
Be as humble as you can. Be as gentle and patient as you can. So there's only one place where Jesus describes his own heart. Matthew 11, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am humble, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. So, so Paul didn't get that out of nowhere. Th these are defining characteristics of Jesus Christ. So let's start there, he says. This is why I said the two things I want you to take note of here. The first thing, something had to happen inside each of our team members here to, to get with the program, with, with making the shape. They had to actually have an amount of humility, didn't they, to go with where someone said to move. You needed an ounce of humility to make a triangle. You absolutely needed humility. That's why Lucifer couldn't play that game. It, it, it's so significant. Listen to this. John Adair wrote a book years ago, a really helpful one on leadership. And he talks about leadership driven by humility. He said, here are the six most important words of leadership driven by humility. I admit I made a mistake. Then he says, here's the five most important words of leadership. I am proud of you. Then he said, here's the four most important words of leadership. What is your opinion? He said, then here's the three most important words of leadership, if you please. Here's the two most important words of leadership, thank you. And he said, here's the most important word of leadership, we, driven by humility, that's often how it's going to look. Just here's some names in world politics. Nelson Mandela, Donald Trump, Nelson Mandela, personal humility led to the unification of an incredibly divided nation. And personal pride has led to an inflaming and making worse of a situation where a country has a whole lot to be in agreement about, but is not. Humility is where he starts. And here's Probably the biggest reason, I think, why you should pay attention to the idea of humility to start with. For us, we won't grow to become mature as a church until we pursue maintaining the unity we've been given. I heard it's nearly 40 years since we did a church camp. We, we started to try to do some new things. Church camps don't solve everything. You shouldn't feel bad if you're not at the church camp. <laughs> it's not trying to say, you don't care about unity. I'm not saying that at all. But a very important saying in Alcoholics Anonymous says, if nothing changes, nothing changes. If we're not going to make every effort with this, we're not going to experience the unity. And guess what? We're going to stay immature. It's a very big factor to see what Paul's trying to say. And here's the thing he says. He says, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And then down at verse 14, listen, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth. Did you hear what Paul's saying? I don't know if you've ever connected the dots here, but Paul said we. This is astonishing. The Apostle Paul said we. In other words, he's saying, I'm in that. <laughs> I'm going to be a part of the immature tribe we, he's saying, I need you guys. He's not saying I'm fine. He's saying, actually, I'm immature without us working this out. So if Paul can say that, my goodness, I'm in there. All of us have to be in there. He's one of the greatest human beings of all history, historically. For him to say, if we don't pursue maintaining the unity we've been given, then I'm a part of our immaturity. You can imagine that pride really is such an enemy to unity, isn't it? You know, if you think you're better than someone or better than everyone, how, how do you pursue unity? How could that happen? You know, social media sites, they, they sort of enhance the differences, don't they? So sort of, you know, the people who are, they get on these sites, they're good. These other people, they're wallies. Nothing dispels division like humility, though. 
See, if you've ever had a conflict with someone and they were humble and self-aware and said, I, I need to understand how I've, how I've hurt you, that changes everything. You know, pride makes me believe that your failures are the most important issue. And humility makes me believe that my failures are the most important issue. So what this passage teaches is when the life of God comes into me, I become an infant. When the life of God comes in us, we become like newborn babes. Basically, there's dirty nappies all around the room. That's what he's saying. <laughs> That's all of us. That when God comes into our life, that's how it begins. And time, just tenure as a Christian, does not make maturity magically happen. So much written about humility and greatness. Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, says when you have great leadership combined with humility, it changes everything. And so in the Bible, you've got examples of where pride ruins the whole thing. Rehoboam, King Rehoboam, he goes to his dad's advisors when he's king and says, what should I do? And they say, listen, take it easy on the people. And then he goes to the young punks and says, what should I do? And they say, be twice the man your dad was. Make them fear you. And in his story, pride divides a nation, a whole nation. And it's only reconstituted, reunited through the perfect, humble one, Jesus Christ. And so I said there's two things, something going on inside them, and the other piece of the puzzle is the rope, the centrality of the rope. I tied a knot that, that really shouldn't come undone, that tightens on itself when you tighten it, so, you know. And, and, and the centrality of what Jesus has done is not gonna, it's not gonna fall apart. This is about holding onto the rope. This whole passage gives us four ways that unity is achieved. Humility and the second one, the centrality of what Jesus has done. And so when Jesus was, was trying to school and teach, disciple his followers, make, help, them, help them grow, he was getting them to grow to maturity. They go off on this amazing mission trip, come back and say, oh, look, this happened, that happened. People were healed. The demons did what we said, all this great stuff. And he said, cool, but your name's written in heaven. Get more excited about that. What's Jesus doing? He's trying to grow them to become mature. He's moving them to hold on to the central thing that you're saved. You know, you, you will flip a lot. You will find experience anyway being tossed back and forth if you tie your central joy to God's answering this, God's answering that. God's, it's like Janet Jackson's philosophy of life. Janet Jackson, you know the singer, great singer. What have you done for me lately? You know that song? <laughs> That's often what we're like with God. What have you done for me lately? Oh, he's prayed here. Oh, he didn't answer that one. He answered. You, you will be tossed back and forth if your joy is tied to what's going on instead of you're saved, man. He's never going to let you go. That rope is not going to break. He's saying, tie your joy to that. Start there. It's a very important thing Jesus is doing. Now, here's, so, it's so important because what we seem to do as humans, we have a, a, a tendency to take small differences and create huge divisions. Instead of finding the one large thing that unites us and emphasizing that. That's what Paul's saying to do. Emphasize the centrality of what Jesus has done. He's saying, hold on to that rope instead of focusing on small differences and creating big divisions. Hold on to the rope. So, for example, anyone here follow the English Premier League soccer? Anyone, anyone a Liverpool fan? Hands down. <laughs> Who's a Liverpool fan? No? Anyone? Oh, we have one. Yes, we have maybe two. Three. Three friends. <laughs> I found out this weekend your dad. Yes. On the same team for once with Dave Connell. <laughs> He's our treasurer. He's a good one to be on the same team with. But I'm just saying, Liverpool, I go for Liverpool. You know what's interesting about Liverpool supporters? We couldn't care less about hockey teams in Edmonton and London area. We couldn't care less about them. But we have a real problem with Manchester United supporters. <laughs> we have a particular disdain for that team and their supporters. They have a very similar sort of financial state of their club, 
Their home turf is not far from ours and they play in red. We take little differences and create huge divisions. That's what human beings do best. And Paul's saying, stop it. Do the opposite, exactly the opposite. Saying, do not take those small differences and create huge divisions, but take the one unifying reality of Jesus and the gospel and make emphasize that, the one thing that unites us. The unifying feature of us as a church is our relationship to Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings us together. Let's emphasize him and what he's done. Not all the small differences. Huge, huge teaching points. So he says here, make every effort, verse 3, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Verse 4, oh no, and then down verse 16 he says, from him the whole body. You see, it's the work of God among us. We're maintaining a unity that's been given. Verse 16, from him we're going to be built up, strengthened together. So he's saying, let's focus on the stuff God is doing among us, and that's what he's doing through Jesus. And so you end up with verse 4, where he says, so there's one body. Let's there's, there's, there's focus on the centrality piece, the rope. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called, to one hope, where you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It's so expansive. The centrality is the way unity is going to come. Huge. That's the basis for every person who's a Christian there. So the word community, the word communion, the word communication connect to the word common, don't they? If we've got nothing in common, we can't be united. Our relationship to Jesus is what we have in common. That's how we become united, the centrality of that. Now in this passage, he goes further, we're not going to deal with the second half of the passage. If you're on the weekend away, you would have heard um, Craig talk about the, the diversity of the body is how unity is achieved as well. And, and the outcome of what we said today, humility, centrality, diversity, would be maturity, which James was going to talk about. If you're coming tonight to church, James will, you'll get to hear James, a bit of the weekend, you get to hear him tonight talking about maturity. So we pursue it, we don't ignore it, we pursue it, but it's mostly the outcome of the first three, of humility, centrality and diversity. The diversity piece is so important to consider because we as a species, as human beings, have a tendency to conform to, to uniformity, to standardization instead of uniqueness, right? So, so God talks about our oneness without losing your uniqueness. That's amazing about God. You can't get over the fact he made you all different. And that's very important to our unity. And so, so the images Paul uses all the time are so helpful. You know, the body, the, the foot doesn't need to be envious of the ear because you need each other. The hand doesn't need to worry that you're not an eye because you need the eye. The hand, you know, you need each other. You need the difference. How, how does a plane get in the air? The differentiation of its parts working together. Think, think of all the parts that you've got a fuselage, you've got landing gear, you've got a cockpit, you've got engines, you've got, you've got wings and ailerons, you've got all such individuated, such distinctiveness to all those different parts. You can't get in the air with just landing gear. <laughs> you need all those distinct different bits and then a willingness to come together and do their part at the right time. And then it gets in the air. That's, otherwise flight can't happen. It's such a powerful idea. It's true in families. So teenagers are where everything gets, everything gets stirred up, doesn't it? Some of you with little kids, you think it's, it's fun now? <laughs> like, quite seriously. Because those beautiful little individuals actually emerge when they discover their identity is not only going to be attached to you, but they're going to become an I in this beautiful we of your family. They're actually going to become more distinct. They're going to start having different opinions, different approaches to life, different approaches to thinking, to creativity, to what they want to do in life. And that dis individuation, if that's not honoured, boy, it's hard work. It's hard work for the child. And the family 
is a bit like a plane that's going to struggle to get in the air until you can honour that difference. If differentiation can't happen for a teenager, they're going to want to set their hair on fire or just get out of the place. It's so crucial. So, so listen, kids, we mess up with that as parents a lot of the time. Sometimes we're way too harsh and we, and we take a long time before we start to become less rigid. And, and, and teenagers, if, if there's not many in the room here now, <laughs> but, but like also know that sometimes mum and dad are trying to love you and give you boundaries. You need to see the benefit of good boundaries. But it, there's this beautiful thing of, as you grow and as we grow as a church, are we willing to actually honour the differences? You know, a lot of times in churches, um, there's a tendency for not unifying difference, but uniformity. Uh, there's a tendency that we have, to, we have to listen to the same music. We all have to read John Calvin. We all, we all have to speak in tongues or prophesy. We all have to do the same stuff. And, and that's actually not God's picture here. Anywhere. The diversity is essential for unity and getting in the air. It's very, very important. The last piece, I hope it makes sense, that that's the only way to maturity. So I, I, hope, I hope there's been plenty to think about and encourage you as well as challenge us all. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing and then it's a morning tea and time together. But yeah. Father God, thank you for your, the Bible and everyone here. Thank you for the way that you show up in our lives. We ask God you help us become more aware of the ways that you show up. And more aware of the significance of us being not just in the room this morning, but in this tribe, in this family of Christians. Thank you for the invitation of this passage, not just to attend church, but to be the church. Th thank you for giving us not just freedom from the consequences of our wrongdoing, of our sin, but that Jesus is ascended. And so you empower us, enable us to actually live a different way. We ask God you'd speak to our hearts, continue to speak to us as we, as we sing and then as we gather and please help us see the significance of actually making every effort this morning to maintain the unity that you've given us. We ask you help in that in Jesus' name.